All right, it is uh, SQL Friday again, and this time SQL Friday number 82 with the, uh, I should have asked you before how to pronounce your first name. I think it's Reitze. Uh, yeah, excellent. Ah, whew, I won. <laughs> uh, welcome to SQL Friday. Uh, you're going to talk about uh, monitoring Azure SQL, Azure in parentheses, so I guess Ash monitoring SQL uh, with the uh, Savix. And we we had just a little chat before before I started the recording that I, I have some experience with Sabex, but it's a while ago. So this is going to be interesting for me. Welcome to SQL Friday. All right. Thanks a lot, Magnus, uh, for having me and uh, for allowing me to uh, share this uh, session with you all. Um, Yes, I'm going to talk uh, uh, about monitoring a SQL database with Zabbix, but uh, I'm going to uh, monitor Azure SQL databases as well, because there are some differences in how you can monitor and uh, all the things that are uh, happening there. Um, I'm going to do a few demos, um, but uh, when I'm during or during the talk, I'm not going to do most of them live because most things do take a little bit of time uh, uh, to set up and configure. And I just want to talk you to, uh, through the entire process. And when you're getting the slide deck, you'll see the steps all uh, written out for you that might help you when you're going to try this on your own. Um, about questions, um, before the recording started, I asked Magnus, um, if there are any questions, uh, ask them immediately, because when you've got a question and I'm talking about something, it's the, the for me, it's a natural place to start answering them. Uh, and it's easier to go back in, uh, to slides or move a bit forward. All right. First up, why do you want to monitor? Well, you can create baselines. And with baselines, you can see something has changed. Um, if the new baseline is different, if you've got uh, baseline A from a week ago and baseline uh, from this week is a bit different, it doesn't necessarily mean there's a problem. But you can see uh, differences, you might be able to analyze them, and uh, when there are problems arising, you can most probably see where they're coming from. You can detect issues, because no server is going to tell you I've got an issue unless you're logged into it and it's going to uh, throw some angry errors in your face. So monitoring can, uh, can help you with uh, uh, issue detection. Also, you can save the history. So if you're at night asleep, I hope you are uh, sleeping at night, and troubles arise, you don't want to be uh, uh, woken up uh, with, yeah, well, we've got a bit of a wait set issue or something like that. It's nice to be able to do that analysis in the morning and check out what has happened or what's uh, going to be happening or what might happen. And you can use monitor monitoring just to see what your instance is doing at this moment. Why do you want to do that? Well, you want proactive management. You want to be ahead of problems, see them uh, coming up. Um, if there are a lot of heavy queries running and uh, you can see that your processor is losing uh, 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 worker threads, you can uh, try and kill the heavy ones or make sure uh, people aren't running all the queries at the same time. It helps with maintenance because it's going to tell you I've got an issue coming up here. Um, with any luck, you'll be able to tackle a problem be before it becomes an issue to your end users. My week usually is successful when I haven't heard from end users because they haven't had any problems. And you can dive into uh, issues from the past because you can scroll back into time and see what happened uh, uh, days, hours, weeks ago. And what are we going to monitor on Azure? First thing you need to realize um, is you can't monitor everything because all the data you're monitoring has to be stored somewhere in the database. And before you know it, you've got so much data you can't do anything with it. So you need to be sure to think about what you want to monitor. Also, you need to remember that Azure SQL databases are different from SQL databases. I'm going to show you a few examples in, uh, uh, further in this uh, presentation. But every database is different. My main job is working with uh, um, data warehouse databases, and they've got a completely different behavior compared to OTP databases. So you need to think about what is a useful trigger. And every time you come to see results, you need to do some interpretation and decide what is this thing telling me? What's happening? Now, how, you can, how can you monitor your environment? You can use Management Studio, maybe Azure Data Studio. It's got some nice graphics, but 
it's not really going to help you and history isn't available there. You could use the S portal. There's some history there, there's some grass there, you can check out some things, but it's not exactly what I would call monitoring. If you haven't got anything, it's at least a starting point. You can use a number of uh, uh, software um, packets from uh, different vendors, the more or less expensive, you can use that. It's excellent. Uh, you can think uh, about a company like Quest, Redgate or Century One. They've got excellent tooling, but it's expensive. For those of you who've been around a bit longer, uh, they might have heard uh, or followed the session by Gianluca Sartori about uh, the tick stack. So using Grafana and uh, all kinds of cool uh, uh, stuff to monitor your stuff, uh, your environment. It's quite hard to set up, in my opinion, and I didn't get it to work on an Azure SQL database. And that is one of the things that was my uh, uh, my goal. I want to monitor my Azure SQL database. So I ended up with Zabbix. Now what you're going to learn, hopefully in this session, is that Zabbix can be cool. Configuration isn't all that hard anymore. Um, before the session started, I had a, a small conversation with Magnus and he said, well, it was quite hard to configure everything and uh, it, it wasn't all that intuitive. Nowadays, in my opinion, uh, uh, that has uh, improved a lot and it's not really hard to configure. So you can do it. You're able to, uh, to make this work. You can do magical things. And at the end, I'll uh, have a few presents for you uh, to take home. My name is Reitse Eskens. Um, I'm working for a company called Axians, uh, a European IT company uh, in all kinds of areas, not just IT, but communication as well, part of Finchie Energies. I'm not here to promote this company. I'm working for them and um, this subject, it's, it's all open source, so I'm not trying to sell you anything. I'm just hoping to uh, take you on my journey with, uh, uh, with this tooling. If you have any questions, you can reach me on Twitter uh, or uh, through my email uh, at the bottom left. Reach out to me. I'm, uh, I'm happy to help you out if you run into uh, uh, stuff. Now, oh. what is Subix? For those of you who haven't heard of it or uh, maybe uh, know the name but never touched it, it's originally built to monitor infrastructure. Things like servers, mainframes, switches, firewalls, or all that kind of stuff. The usual hardware iron that was in your uh, company. Built on Linux, it has a graphical interface. You can uh, access, it, access it through your browser. Because it's running on Linux, it has a really small footprint in, in your organization because Linux is open source. When you're using uh, Ubuntu di distribution, it's free. Uh, Zabbix is free, so it's, it's a free solution and it's really powerful. It doesn't matter what uh, edition of Linux you're using. If you want to go for the uh, commercial Red Hat release, it works as well. Now, when you first log in, there are a lot of predefined templates, but uh, there's a large community that's uh, providing all kinds of templates and cool stuff uh, you can use as well. Can I ask something? Yeah, of course. Uh, did you try running it on uh, Windows subsystem for Linux? I didn't. I wanted to. But uh, my problem was I couldn't get the Linux subsystem for Windows running correctly. Okay. <laughs> and, and that, that has everything to do with my knowledge of Linux. <laughs> All right. But it's a, it's, a, it's a really good one. Uh, you might be able to run it uh, there as well. I'm going to try it again. Uh, you've triggered something in my head right now. I want to I wanna try and see if it runs there as well. Yeah, and I think we, uh, when I said the question, I, I kind of uh, thought to myself, I need to test. I mean, that's that's usually the way I want to find out is to try it. Thank yeah, you. Excellent. Uh, absolutely. Um, why would you want to run Zebex? Well, maybe it's already running it in your organization and you can just walk over to the guys uh, administering it and telling them, asking them, or telling them, asking them, I want to monitor a few of my SQL databases. Can you help me out? Because already pre-installed, you don't have to do all the hassle of installing it, configuring it. All you need to do is add the SQL databases in your rough. There are a number of templates for SQL Server, Oracle, and a number of other databases. I'm going to show you the list uh, in a few moments. So there's not much configuration to do. Uh, 
from my point of view, it's not really, uh, it's quite easy to learn. It's not, not that hard and you can create your own templates. Once you've figured out how templates are built, it's not that hard to build your own and you can add all kinds of stuff. And as I said, you can show your results on a, on a dashboard chat in your organization um, and look at it, how awesome it looks. Now, when you first install it, you can get something like this. And this is not the end results you want to uh, use in your organization. Because Subex really wants to show you the system information of its own server. So I mean, I'm running, I'm doing all this and uh, uh, all kinds of measurements that mean don't mean all that much to you. It's got a number of colored squares telling you things are good or not good. Yeah, cool. But the best part is at the right, the list of problems. That's the part that's interesting because that's going to tell you where things are running not all that smoothly or not the way you want. On the left, there's a, a, a graph of my environment. Um, it's something I created myself, and I think this really disqualifies me as a front end user because I'm really, really bad at creating uh, things like this. I'm not a dashboarding kind of guy. So please don't look at this at, uh, as well. My dashboard should look like this. It shouldn't. Now, if you want to install and configure Zabbix, um, there are a lot of installation guides online. Um, I'm using the one that's uh, provided uh, on the Zebex site. Um, one thing I'm going to tell you, that uh, instruction is not complete. I installed the demo machine I'm using for this session about two weeks ago, and the scripts on the Zebex site missed out on telling me I need to install a database. So the scripts were running and telling me I'm not seeing a database. Well, you should be installing the database for me. It didn't, so I had to do it manually. And there were other things that were happening, and I'm going to touch on them, touch on them later in the session as well. You need to configure a firewall on your Linux machine because if you don't, everyone can get access one way or the other. So make sure you, you uh, you're thinking about the security of the environment. Within Zabbix, you can create all kinds of user accounts uh, uh, where you can uh, connect to groups or whatever. And there's one thing you need to do. You need to create your uh, SQL ODBC connection in Linux. And make sure uh, you take care of who can access that folder because it's got connection uh, uh, data inside of it. No password, don't worry. But it's telling, uh, uh, it, it might lead someone to, oh, there's a nice server over there. So make sure you can you control who can access the folder where the uh, uh, ini files are located. All right, my first demo in slides, because I'm gonna uh, show you the running environment later. The first thing you need to do is you need to um, install the OLPC drivers. This script you're seeing right here is coming from the Microsoft site uh, where you can download uh, both the driver and the script to uh, do this. And all you need to do is copy this, run it, and it will install the ODBC drive for you. You need to do this on a Linux machine. When I first tried this out, I thought, well, I'm running Linux, um, uh, uh, I'm in my uh, uh, service environment. Oh, I need the ODBC drive, so I'm going to install the ODBC drive on the machine I'm working on. But Linux or Subbix doesn't know that. It needs to be on a Linux machine, so don't make that mistake. Uh, code may seem a bit weird, but all it's doing is uh, getting the uh, ODPC driver and installing it on your uh, Linux server, and it's there. But there's nothing inside of it. What you need to do, you need to uh, edit the ini file to make sure it can go somewhere. This is the standard you're ending up, uh, you're getting from uh, Microsoft. It's got a DSN name. And that's just the name of uh, uh, your ODBC connection. It's got a driver. And in my case, it's the ODBC drive 17 for SQL Server. And it's got, you need to add a server connection. Uh, you need to tell it where the server is living. Localhost can work if your uh, um, SQL instance is running on your Linux machine where you've installed Subbox as well. But you don't want that. You don't want to mix up monitoring and, and data as well. So what you need to do is find out where is my 
server living. This is the option you need for um, uh, the Azure one. I'm going to touch on this, uh, uh, this one a bit later, um, but these are the uh, uh, four lines you need to get a uh, connection running. More details on this one later. As I told you, um, Zabbix includes a number of templates um, and it's got SQL templates as well, where most basic things are included. Uh, and there are triggers there, but you need to check those triggers because your environment might have a specific behavior that keeps triggering the, tri triggering the triggers. It's a weird sentence, but um, they might fire too fast. Or some might fire not at all, just when you want them to fire because of your workloads. From my point of view, templates are incomplete. There are all kinds of things missing for my uh, uh, for the way I'm working, so you need to add them uh, for yourself. I need to check the configuration of all the scripts because there are sometimes weird things happening. I'm going to show you that in a minute as well. Earlier, I told you I'd show you uh, a list of all the databases that are supported by uh, Zabbix. This is one list. It's got the Apache, Cassandra, uh, ClickHouse, Ignite, uh, MongoDB, SQL, MySQL, of course, because uh, uh, Zabbix is running on MySQL. It's got Oracle connections, Postgres, uh, Postgres, QL, and Redis. From my point of view, or my experience is this list will grow in, uh, in time. More databases will become supported. There's one thing that might uh, uh, attract your attention, the second one from the talk. Second one from the top, uh, it's the Axion's SQL performance. It's a template uh, and that I'm going to touch on later. It's a special one. And when you're going to try and define a host in uh, Zabbix, a host is uh, the basic of all the monitoring. A host is something you're connecting to and you're going to uh, uh, monitor. And there's a few things there. First up is your host name. This host name needs to be the name of your instance when you're doing on-premise monitoring. The visible name below it is anything you want it to be. So you can do, uh, enter any name you, you like to identify your environment. I'm using the MS SQL by ODBC template. I've connected to, to a group because Zabbix likes to use groups. And this is the important one. It has an interface, and the interface is telling, is asking where is my agent living? Because Zabbix can't connect to a server unless there's an agent running there. And it's connecting to an IP ad address. In this case, 10404. You can add a DNS name as well. It's not uh, 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 obligated, but you can add it as well. And it's got port 10050, default port. With this, you've uh, uh, completed your configuration of your host. No, you haven't. Because when, you need to connect, when you're connecting to a SQL instance, you need to tell it, how can I log in? What's the name of this thing? Again, we're going to use the DSN, SQL Express 2012, which is in my uh, uh, odbc.ini. The name of the instance, password, it's not uh, uh, saved in clear text, luckily. It's a password text. I need to add the port. Make sure this port is also in your ODBC ini file, because if you haven't got it there, it won't connect. And it'll throw all kinds of weird errors. And of course, we need the user uh, that we're using to connect to the, uh, to the instance. Right here, I'm using my admin user. That is very much not best, best practice, but for the purposes of this demo, the easier way in and out. OK, cool. Let's start monitoring. And then you're getting issues. All kinds of things start turning red uh, uh, within your host list. All weird things are happening. Why? Because not only uh, is Subex not telling you to install your SQL or MySQL database to save the uh, data, it's also not telling you that you need to install OpenSSL. Because when you're connecting to your uh, SQL databases, it's using an SSL uh, connection. You need to add uh, uh, this uh, um, package on your Linux machine to make sure uh, it's going to use uh, uh, the OpenSSL um, 
stuff. Don't forget to restart both uh, the web server and the Zabbix server because if you don't, it's not picking up on the fact that it's got the open SSL uh, stuff running and your connections keep failing. When everything is set up, you might end up with something like this. On the left, I've got my uh, my hosts, my management uh, uh, VM, uh, my databases with the names I like them. Um, I can see it's available because the Zabbix icon is green. These are my Windows servers. The ones that are not turning up green are my databases. Got three ones here. You can see it here as well. It's got uh, uh, automa uh, automatically tags. It's got a database class and the target is SQL. And when I'm going to the right, I can see there are problems. When you're, uh, uh, when your uh, monitoring is running, you can go get a lot of graphs. When I'm done with uh, my presentation part, I'm going to log into my uh, environment and show you a, a lot of graphs and uh, stuff you can get from, uh, from them. Now, my second demo is about the Azure stuff. And this screenshot might have been better to put earlier in this uh, presentation. This is my list of all my uh, uh, OWSA INI, uh, 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 the contents of my OWSA INI. At the top, there's uh, my SQL Express 2012, I've got a, a 2017, I've got another uh, uh, database, and at the bottom, I've got an Azure. And there are some differences there. Because my usual uh, uh, on-premises server, if you like, is just driver and server, a TCP connection, name of the instance and a port number. For my Azure database, I've got my same driver. My server is the fully qualified domain name, including the database.windows.net, and the name of my database. Because in Azure, I can't do any cross database queries. So I need to add the name of my database. So when you've got uh, a lot of databases, you're gonna add a lot of uh, lines into this file to get all the connections running and working. When I'm configuring uh, all this stuff, you might run into this uh, uh, message you can't, that uh, Zabbox cannot add the host. And it's going to throw something from cannot host, uh, find host interface. Why not? Because it needs a private endpoint. It needs an IP address. Without an IP address, it just can't connect to anything. It can't connect to uh, just the, 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 the fully qualified domain name. It needs an IP address. So you need private endpoints <coughs> in your uh, environment to connect to. When you're doing that, you can see that one uh, right here. I've got my uh, AW Restore, call it that way. And I've got the different IP address. You can see 10409, where the others are all 10404, which means we've got three instances on one server. Again, not best practice, but for a demo, it works. And still the same port number, even though it's not using this port number. For my connection, quite the same uh, uh, variables in the uh, in the macro section. Only a thing that's missing is port number because it's running on the default port 1433. So I don't need to add the port anymore because it's a default one. And there's a tricky one here because it needs the name of the instance. And if you're uh, whatever name you're using, it's not going to work when you're trying to get some data because this is what will be returned by the most queries that are going to uh, get data from the instance. On the top, you're going to see object name Microsoft SQL Azure, and it's going to uh, get some uh, values. It's going to tell you what uh, uh, what version it is, so it's going to tell you when your uh, uh, database has received an update. But below, all the counters, not giving you the MS SQL Azure back, but some kind of GUID. That's the internal name of the instance running on Azure. And every time you're going to change your database, for instance, scaling it up or down, it's going to give a different uh, uh, identifier back to you. 
this is something you want to catch before you before you try monitoring. It took me some time to figure out where uh, uh, this was happening, but in the end I found this. There's an object inside uh, um, your monitoring that's called MSQL performance counters. That's the main object that's going to return a lot of information. And what you need to do, you need to change it. I'm going to show you uh, uh, the original one and the, the one I've changed uh, uh, later uh, in my live environment. Be what you need to do is make sure you change the name to a fixed name. In this case, I've called it Azure to make sure it's going to return the same name every time, uh, regardless of uh, what instance is running on. This makes sure you get all the data. Now, when I'm running this query and testing it out, I'm getting my Azure stuff back. This is what I want. When you're trying to run all this stuff on Azure, you're going to find out that not everything is supported. Things like availability groups discovery, it's not supported because Azure and availability groups are two different things. Local database discovery, it's not supported because you're always connected to one database. Same as mirroring, non-local replication, all stuff like that. It can discover databases. It will discover just one, but it can discover it. So you need to be aware that not everything is working and you need to take care uh, or work your way around those. Okay, we fill out all the information, we can connect to the instance and we're going to start monitoring. These are the main uh, items service will be looking for. These items will uh, return data. But it's not the final stage because these items are going to return a lot of data. In my previous slide, I've shown you uh, the enormous amount of data that's coming back. Uh, that was the uh, SQL GET performance counter uh, uh, object. And it's going to return a lot of performance counters. How are you going to monitor them if you get all this information at once? There are dependent items in, uh, in Zabbix. The dependent item is an item that's going to get uh, uh, go to the main item and just get one part of it. So these items are going to get the cache object in use, the database pages, total data file size, things like that. You're going to grab just that part of the information. And the data is coming back is kind of a JSON file. So it's going to scroll down through the JSON file uh, until it finds uh, the part it needs. And that's all it's going to, to save. All these dependent items um, are passed one row at a time. So it takes a little bit of time. But when your server is strong enough, you, you won't really notice it. But all these items, they're going to, yeah, numbers. We don't want numbers, we want graphs. I've shown you in the previous slide uh, something about uh, objects. This is one of the graphs that's derived from it. It's going to show you the amount uh, uh, of objects that's in the cache. Something happened around 1615 that the amount of uh, objects was dropped. Things like this can tell you something or not. It's just really depending on your environment. But you want to know when something something is really happening. That's where the triggers come in. Because triggers, I'm going to tell you something happened, I need to tell you. There are a few levels of triggers. That are, uh, I've shown you three. I think there are four or five uh, uh, in, in Zavix that you can configure. Warning, high and disaster are the most important ones because, well, there's a warning. Uh, you need to uh, look into something. When it's high, you need to look at something now. And when it's a disaster, I'm sorry, you were too late. You get a lot of triggers. You need to make sure if these triggers are configured correctly or if you're missing something. Um, when the trigger fires, it shows on your main dashboard and you can read them and, and take action if needed. You can also disable triggers. And this is one important part because you need to make sure you know who is able to disable your triggers. Because when I'm disabling a trigger that my service is unavailable, I can do all kinds of nasty things. You don't want that. You want to make sure that only the people that are allowed to play with your triggers uh, can do so. Now we're going to the fun part because we're going to create our own templates. We can configure all the uh, all the me measurements and all the triggers. Uh, we can add dashboards and do all kinds of funky things to make our life easier. 
And you can share it uh, with the entire community, but make sure you share it with your peers in your organization as well. Just get a, get a review. I've created this template. It's going to show all these kinds of stuff. Am I complete? Am I missing something? Or did I make a, 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 a miscalculation somewhere? In my uh, uh, field of work, wait stats are essential. We're loading data warehouse databases and sometimes processes take a lot of time. And I want to know what was the database waiting for, waiting on? Was it waiting on disk, on uh, uh, the remote server uh, uh, providing information or some other process, maybe disk was slow, uh, um, anything that can explain what was happening at the time. So I'm creating my own because the default templates don't really monitor on wait stats. I want them, all of them. So I'm using a, a query to get my uh, get my data. You can see it at the bottom here. And this one wasn't thought of by myself. This is just a standard Paul Randall uh, wait set query. I've configured it with the username, with the password. I'm telling it to use the ODBC to get the data. Then I need my dependent item because all the wait sets, the entire list is way too much for me. I want the different wait sets separated. So I've got to create my wait stats thread pool. It's a dependent item. It's got a key because on the previous, I've got my wait stats, all of them. And here I'm going to tell them I want from my wait sets the thread pool. I've got my master item. That's where my information is coming from. And I want to save it. And there are two ways of saving it. I've got my history storage. It's just one day. This will check every X minutes or seconds. It will show me the data. If that time slot has passed, so it's uh, data is older than one day, it's going to the trend storage. It's going to store my trends for a year. This means that when I want to go back three or four days in time, I won't get the uh, really fine detailed information. I can't zoom in on every second or every minute or whatever I've chosen to uh, to monitor. It'll give me more of a trend line over time. It saves uh, uh, data and it uh, makes sure when you're uh, querying a lot of or, or larger period, make sure you get the results uh, quite quickly. But not only do I want the absolute value of my uh, my weight stats. I want them compared to the previous one. Because when I'm only seeing a rising line, because most of you will know uh, uh, weight statistics are not um, uh, uh, saved inside SQL Server as over, over a period, but from the point the instance has started and then the, the numbers will add up. So I need to add a calculated item. That's going to tell me I want uh, the difference between my last weight stats and my previous weight stats. And that will tell me when there's a spike or going to show me when there's a spike in the, in the wait sets. And when I've created that calculated item, that's the one I'm going to use in my graph. So this will tell me when there were, uh, which wait stats were uh, uh, high at what time point in time. So I see expected weights, uh, well, they weren't, most of the time they weren't there, except at a few moments in time when they were suddenly spiking. Um, my thread pool, it's been there for 11 milliseconds. On average, it's uh, way less than that. I, I don't even know how to, to uh, pronounce 0 0.002 milliseconds, but it's not all that much on average. And the last one was 0 milliseconds, so it's uh, right now it's not a problem. This will give you some idea of the weight sets that are running in your uh, environment. You can group them together in, in some kind of dashboard with uh, all kinds of other uh, process uh, um, measurements. So you can see the number of CPU cores. In this case, this is from another environment uh, where we're running uh, a large database that's scaling up and down between uh, uh, two and uh, 16 cores. So you can see the scale up and scale down of the, of the cores. Uh, the CPU layout uh, uh, is having and the weight stats. 
and they're all in the same time frame, so you can do some analysis and zoom in on all the data. You can configure the dashboard to any uh, 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 time period you like, whether it's last 30 days or this week or last one day or last five minutes. When you want to create these uh, custom uh, templates, you could create them through the GUI. But I would not advise it because you will end up with uh, a lot of frustration and maybe repetitive strain, uh, strain injury. What you want to do is script it. You want to script it and create an XML because in the end, all Zavix does is uh, uh, save XML and, and go from there. This is the uh, uh, XML that's used to um, for my calculated item on weight stats. OK, cool. So how many have you got? Well, about 270 of them. I did not type all them. So what you're going to do is going to run a query on your database that will give all the information it needs based on the weight types that are available in your database. Because in 2008, there were uh, other and less weight types than there are in 2019. And my guess is 2022 will have even more weight types. So you're going to need to play around with that and run this query. In the beginning, I told you I had some presents for you. One of the presents is you're going to get this query for me. You can either screenshot this one if you want, or I just add it to the uh, materials uh, or resources on my GitHub. Um, and when you uh, so when you're uh, going to my uh, uh, GitHub repository, uh, to my speaking part uh, of this session, you'll find the files there. I'll also include something else. And for that, I'm going to switch to my live environment because I've been talking from slides way too much. Uh, Magnus, I haven't heard you from you, so I'm thinking there are no other questions. There are no questions right now, no. Ah, OK, cool. Um, I'm going to get myself out of the way for this part. As I told you, this is the basic setup of my uh, uh, Zabbix environment. You can see here all thing, uh, all kinds of things were happening. When I go into my configuration, I'm going to hosts. These are all the uh, uh, all the things that are happening here. This is my configuration. What you want in your monitoring environment, there are hosts as well. You can see there are all kinds of stuff you can find here. Right now, I've got my Azure demo database right here, 10409, and there are a few problems there. And I've got a number of graphs and dashboards. And these dashboards didn't get here by, uh, by themselves. I've created them because these are parts of our SQL performance dashboard. Things I've combined together uh, for me that I, I uh, that I find useful. I've got my CPU cores, I've got my CPU load, I/O load, all kinds of things happening there to see what's happening. And I've got a few of them. I've got my uh, performance dashboard, and I've, uh, I've got a few other ones. I've got my CPU performance, I/O performance. Let's look at I/O. What's happening on Azure? So I'm going to measure my I/O performance on Azure. What's my I/O load? Um, and the I/O lo I/O load is not measured in uh, a regular uh, um, units of measurement you're used to uh, on premises. It's just giving you back a percentage. Right now, not not much is happening on my uh, uh, Azure database, so it's about 0.08 percent. Let's go to another host because I have been running some queries against one of my uh, databases. I'm using SQL query stress just to let something happen. And I've run it against my uh, SQL NSOD instance. All right, that should be this one. Let's see what kind of graphs there are here. This is the default monitoring you'll get from, uh, from Zavix. It's got access methods, auto parameters, it's shown only the last five minutes, and I've been running this query for a bit more, so I'm going to switch to the last three hours. And you can see right here, it's been a bit busy. All kinds of things have happened. The auto parameters were there, number of cache objects, 
quite steady. That's good, maybe. Compilations. Again, a lot of uh, things have been happening. My data pages, I've only been selecting, so that should be steady. Something about errors. And a number of logs. And right here, you're going to see there's a line. And this line is the trigger line. And you've got only 500 logs per second. It's not going to trigger. When you go now for a thousand, it's going to trigger. It's going to show on my dashboard. And at some point in time, it slowly went down to a very low level. The number of login, logouts, memory cache, uh, uh, all kinds of things are here. But this is just graphs and well, because I know where the uh, uh, where the trigger threshold is, I can find it. But there's something else you can do in Zabbix that's here with problems. This one is going to show me all my actual problems and the ones that were uh, recently resolved. These are all things I need to do something about. I've got uh, jobs that were uh, that are failing to run. And this one, a high priority problem. My full backup is older than 10 days. That's an issue. Something happening to the database, my backup is older than 10 days. For instance, I know it's really much older than 10 days. Maybe years old. This way you can scroll through all the problems uh, you have and you might have had. And going back to the configuration, I was talking about the templates. And there are a lot of templates to monitor all kinds of uh, cool stuff. Where I want to go is my Axion SQL performance. This one I've created myself. It's got one host, it's got 206 items. When I go into the items, this is where you can see all the weight stats I'm trying to find out. And some other stuff as well. Here are the weight stats, activate SF code package, async IO completion, all, all, all kinds of things like that. This one also has a number of triggers, about database free space, a number of predefined graphs, and these graphs are graphs that are interesting for me. You can add your own graphs at, uh, in any way you want. And the dashboard you've seen before uh, when I showed you uh, uh, the dashboards from the monitoring hosts. All these things are combined in one XML file. And to make life easier for you and to give you a flying start, I'm going to share this XML file as well. You can import it when you go into templates We've got the option to create a template, which is, what, which is something I did, and you can import one. When you import, you can just choose a file. You can get this XML file, open it, you can import it, and it's there. You can use it. That's all you need to do. Now, one word of warning. Um, of course, you can trust me because I'm an honest, uh, uh, honest person, but there are a lot of templates out, uh, out there in the world. Never ever just import the template because you think it's handy. Read it first. Check out if there's not something weird in it that might cause an issue. Even though it's just XML, there might be something uh, hidden in there that you don't want on your uh, system. I can show you a lot more of uh, uh, my environment, but I'd like to do that based on questions. So I'm going to finish my uh, presentation first. Why would you want to use Subex? Because it might already be there in your organization. You can create your old and your own templates. There's an active community, and most importantly, it's free. So when you start playing around with it, you don't have to ask for funding from your manager or whatever. If you're able to uh, run a Linux VM or uh, uh, Linux uh, within your uh, Windows uh, uh, machine, you can play with it, try it out, and you can see if you can uh, uh, learn to work with it and if it suits everything you need. If you want more info, this is my uh, uh, GitHub link. I've written a blog post uh, uh, on monitoring SQL, ser SQL Server or Azure SQL Server with Webex as well. 
Um, when I was creating and editing this presentation, I found out that my uh, blog post wasn't entirely complete. Let's put it that way. So I'm going to edit it in the in the near future uh, uh, to add more information to it because I saw some screenshots were missing and the text wasn't always as clear as it could be. So I'm going to update it uh, 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 in the near future. Um, but you can get all the uh, uh, all the stuff I've shown you uh, from my GitHub uh, uh, to play with for yourself. For now, th thanks so much for listening. Thanks, Magnus, for having me. If you have any questions, you can ask them now, or you can reach out to me on uh, on these channels. Thanks. And the uh, Twitter handle two meter DBA. Does that mean you're two meter tall? Yeah, I am. All right. So uh, when I look for you on the in-person events, I'll know. I'll just look up. Then. <laughs> <laughs> it's always fun to see people looking around, and uh, um, it's fun to see how people look. Uh, well, you know, in real life, because yeah. from the camera you have no idea if they're tall or small or, or whatever. That's it's always true. fun to meet them in real life. And uh... Magnus, you should register the one meter debate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I should. That would make a great picture, though. <laughs> Us standing together, one meter, two meter DBA. <laughs> well. <laughs> Now the I, challenge is to find a three meter DBA, but and that was the world record two seventy or something. It's like yeah, the something like that. Yeah.